Hello. You're about to see that a sleight of hand goes a long way when it comes to decorating a house. We'll visit the homes of six amazing magicians in this show, from Joel Bauer's Oakfield Retreat in Southern California to master magician Lance Burton's old Kentucky home. Some of the country's top illusionists are about to reveal their secrets of design. Hello, I'm Kirby Van Birch, and I'm talking to you from my home in Branson, Missouri. In just a few moments, I'll take you on a magical tour. Hi, I'm Nancy Glass. Welcome to Magical Homes. We're about to take you inside the homes of some of the country's most famous magicians to see which tricks of the trade make their homes magical. Our first guest is the Prince of Magic himself, Kirby Van Birch, a man who can make anything from a duck to an airplane disappear. Well, when Kirby was designing his home, he wanted to use his magic collection as part of the decorating scheme, and he wanted a look that was mystical and sumptuous. So he went to work with a decorator, and as you're about to see, the result is one of Kirby's best illusions yet. What I started out as a hobby as a child grew into a profession, and then my uh, profession is also my hobby. So I wanted, when you walk in, for that whole flavor to be in here of past masters of magic and posters that I collect and uh, antique magic that I do. I wanted it to uh, also be masculine and be a place that was so comfortable that I could um, sit and create new illusions. There is a magical quality to the home of Kirby Van Birch. Walking through this two-story townhouse is a little like taking a magical mystery tour. And that's just the way the Prince of Magic wanted it. I was looking also for some kooky stuff, something you wouldn't see in a, in a regular home. I wanted it to be uh, what you might expect inside of a magician's home. Kirby Van Birch performed in Las Vegas for seven years before moving his big animal, big magic show to his very own theater in Branson, Missouri. A master of illusion, there isn't much Kirby can't make disappear or appear. When the Vanishing King bought his 2,500 square foot home in 1998, the first thing he wanted to make disappear were its white walls. I wanted a wall that had a glow to it. The final coat on it is a kind of a goldish glaze that gives the room warmth. And I also wanted walls that uh, things, when I hung on the walls, would, would pop out of. The shimmering walls make a perfect backdrop for Kirby's collection of antique magic posters. The ones that I've hung in my home reflect illusions that I do in my show. I've got one where a famous magician named Dante vanished a horse. Well, I also vanished a horse, and Charles Carter vanished an elephant. And I think that I should be uh, the keeper of these posters because I'm carrying on the art form, and I want to keep them together, and I wa want to uh, maintain the history of them. Even with his experience in designing elaborate show sets, Kirby felt he needed the help of an expert when it came to decorating his home. It's so easy to walk into a home and say, oh, this is me, I like this. We all know what we like, but we can't create what we like unless we do that for a living. That's why the, uh, hiring a decorator, and she, she brought uh, so many sources to the table that I was just amazed. I didn't know certain things existed. Behind me, I've got a really cool curtain rod because it's that big and it's carved, but where would you go to find one of those? Even today, I don't know where she found it, but where do you find those? For Kirby, the colors are deep and sumptuous, rich browns, maroons, and purples. The sofa in his living room is a soft and supple leather. It's actually an untreated leather, so it has to be treated pretty careful or it scars up pretty fast, but it's just gorgeous. And I've lived all different ways. I've lived where the stuff hasn't been quality, and, I, and I've lived where it has been quality. But if I'm, making, if I'm working so hard in those hours I'm putting in, um, I do like when I get home to see that uh, that work is reflected somehow. This large bell brought back from Thailand after a show is connected to Kirby's doorbell. This table is carved out of coconut husks. Collectively, all of the unusual pieces help set the perfect mood for dreaming up new magic tricks. You, you just never know when you're going to get an idea. You've got to be able to relax in that atmosphere to really create, at least that's for me. Lighting is important on the stage and at home. Kirby's first choice is actually candlelight. Second to that, he feels large and ornate fixtures balance out the strong and weighty decor. They're massive. They look 
very masculine. It's handmade. I can appreciate the craftsmanship and the time that it, it's involved in that. Kirby felt the same way about these hand-carved doors in his bedroom. But it was the story behind them that most intrigued him. They were once dressing room doors for two of the world's most famous magicians, Harry Houdini and Howard Thurston. But I picked them up in Hong Kong, and they were in a theater that a lot of the great people like Houdini and Thurston had played in the 30s. And these were, these were the actual doors to the dressing room where these guys were. And so when I saw them, and the theater was in bad condition, and the people that sold it to me thought they, that they were you know, they were getting the best of me, but, you know, I knew that I was getting the deal. Most of the bedroom is an Aladdin's dream. The leather-bound sleigh bed has a velvet covering and matching drapes. That's a Moroccan bedspread, and it's uh, also hand-woven with uh, gold thread that is just, I mean, if you actually get a close-up, you're going to say, why, you know, this, I'm going to put a lot of time into this. In fact, I, I feel guilty because I snagged one, you know, and I'm thinking, well, you know, this looks good on the bed, but maybe you should never lay on it. This bejeweled overhead lamp is really an inexpensive ceiling fan bought at a local hardware store. A couple of layers of gold paint, some mosaic glass and beads, and abracadabra. The fixture was easily transformed to match the Moroccan-style theme in the bedroom. Here's something right out of the movies. Literally, Kirby got this sarcophagus or mummy case during an auction at the MGM Film Studios. One good open sesame, and it does. I had it recessed into the wall, so it just looks like an art piece, but if you open it up, then it leads into my closet. It just makes it fun to go to the closet. This is Kirby Van Birch's private casbah, the place to which the Prince of Magic loves to disappear. I have a show at uh, 2 o'clock, and I have one at uh, 8 o'clock, and after every show, we also sign autographs, and we meet the, uh, the public that comes in, so there's really not much of a personal life left by the time you uh, do your whole day at the theater. So that amount of time that you have to yourself it really needs to be quality time in order to recharge your batteries. Coming home needs to be something I can look forward to. Absolutely, I do. Now, Kirby says that one of the toughest challenges while decorating his home wasn't trying to figure out where to put the couch or the bed, but the phone. The telephone. You see, Kirby is one of those people who doesn't like to see all the dangling cords and wires that go with a phone. So he came up with the Disappearing Phone Act. When he needs to make a call or answer one, he just pulls down on one of the magic posters in his house and voila, the phone is revealed. And when he's finished talking, back it goes. No wires, no cords, just magic. There's much more ahead on Magical Homes. Magician Joel Bauer walks us through his majestic home with a beautiful canyon view. Slide of hand wizard Steve Wyrick shows us his modern way of living in Las Vegas. And next, at home with funny man and magician Mac King. We'll be right back and I'll show you around my magical Las Vegas house. Mac King had always dreamed of being a magician, even when he was just a boy growing up in Kentucky. But it wasn't until he packed up his car and moved west that things really began to happen. Mac and his wife settled in Las Vegas, where Mac had lines at some of the city's biggest casinos. His act is unusual and even a little zany, but his home is tranquil and warm. It's true. You can take the boy out of the country, but Mac King says you will never take the feel of the country out of his home. <laughs> then he cut off the center like this. He said, now I have no middle and no ends. Mac King inspires both laughter and awe. I can tell he still had a piece of rope. And that is just the way he likes it. While some magicians make rabbits disappear, Mac King is famous for making his head disappear. He headlines at some of the biggest casinos in Vegas and is a regular on magical television specials. One piece! <laughs> Mac says his humor comes from his upbringing in rural Kentucky, and so does his sense of style. A lot of people come into our house and they say, this is just like my grandmother's house. I mean, that's one of the common things that people say. And I think that is a big compliment, because I, I was always really comfortable at my grandparents' house. Mac King and his wife Jennifer bought their house because its previous owners were a big happy family and they thought that was a good omen. They went to work turning this 2,200 square foot property into a cozy and familiar four bedroom home. 
I think our dream house would be a true Victorian house, um, something back in the Midwest or the Northeast or Kentucky. And there isn't anything like that here, and that's okay. I think we've, if we have a style, I think we've kind of tried to recreate that. We don't have family here, and so we wanted to bring as much of our family here as we could, so we have them in the furniture instead of the people. I'm sitting in my house in my favorite chair. This is the most sentimental piece of furniture in my house. I learned to read when I was sitting in this chair. Uh, this has belonged to my grandfather, Pax King, and uh, this is my dog, Elwood, who's named after my other grandfather. Another piece of furniture was once a family china cabinet, but it's been converted for a more modern use. Uh, that was my grandmother's china cabinet, and she used to leave it with the doors at the top open with all her knickknacks and porcelain and plates and that kind of thing, and I don't have any of those things, I, so I took a skill saw to it and cut out some of the shelves and cut out a big hole in the back so that our TV fits in there. As they tried to establish Mac's career, the couple traveled from town to town carrying everything they owned with them until they could buy a home. Once settled in Las Vegas, Mac and Jennifer began collecting new furnishings, but occasionally Mac would see an older piece he liked, like this table, and presto, he would convert it to meet his needs. In this case, a dining table became a coffee table. It was a you know, regular tall dining room table, and I loved the feet of the table so much. I mean, that was the reason why we bought the table, and I sliced the legs in half, because I'm a magician, that's what we do. We slice stuff in half, and I took those short legs and stuck them back on the table. Mac and Jennifer have created the atmosphere of a Victorian-style home, where one room blends easily into another. The trick to their design was to use some spaces in a non-traditional way. I think that's supposed to be behind us there. The, that was originally intended to be the dining room. And uh, we sort of made it into like a little library, sit in one of those chairs back there in the morning with coffee and the paper. The dining room is open to the kitchen. It features furniture handed down from one generation to another, like this dining table made of tiger oak. The first time I saw it, I said, this is the coolest table, because, I mean, it just gets so huge. I mean, there are maybe four more leaves that we could put in that table, and we, that we have put in that table. So it's, uh, it gets enormous. You know, it's just such a perfect marriage of practicality and sentimentality. I really like the dining room. I like the colors in there. I like the table. I like our rug and I love to entertain. There is a lot of color and texture in Mac and Jennifer's home. The fabrics are varied, and Mac was not afraid to use bold hues, especially on the walls. I wanted to paint it lots of different colors. I mean, I really wanted to be able to sit on my couch there, look into my house and see three different colors at least. But Jennifer wasn't so sure. It was a struggle. I picked out the colors, and she, she was okay with the yellow and the red. And this green wall, she was pretty adamant that we shouldn't have that green wall. And uh, I said, well, let's paint it green, keep it for a while. If you don't like it, we'll paint over it. As it turned out, Jennifer liked the three-color combination, and the walls are a strong background for Mac's magic poster collection. I absolutely love it. And for me, one of the benefits of doing it ourselves is that I think we did a better job than if we had hired somebody. Mac and Jennifer say they know they made an unusual choice in furnishing their Las Vegas home with things they brought from Kentucky, but they feel they have created an oasis in the Nevada desert where the magical memories of childhood will always be with them. Still ahead on Magical Homes, modern design with magic man Steve Wyrick, southern charm with master magician Lance Burton, and next, Hot Design at the Southern California home of Joel Bauer. I'm Joel Bauer. In a moment, you'll see my home. A home that really cooks. He makes his living by performing magic and by talking fast, very fast. So listen closely as magician and entertainer Joel Bauer reveals a few of the decorating secrets behind what he calls his oak castle in Southern California. 
You know, I, I felt for many years that in, in working in the industry that I work in, which is the magic of the mind, and tying in corporations, philosophies, and information, there's a precarious balance between entertainment and communication. In my home, every room, every detail that we contribute to the home has to make sense. If it doesn't make sense, it'll never flow, it'll never go. We had a very dark home. We had a home without texture. We had a home without symmetry or balance. We had a home that just didn't make sense. And when I took all the elements, got the right design team and put them together, I ended up with a home that made sense. And that'll make news. That is Joel Bauer's philosophy of design. He is a whiz at explaining how things work. But it's not real at all. As a matter of fact, the majority of people who see the show, they often say to me, you know, we really came to the show for one reason, to make more money than ever before. For him, everything is about creating a lasting impression. In fact, that's how he makes his living. Joel Bauer is the number one corporate magician in America. He tours the world, performing his own brand of magic to help Fortune 500 companies sell their products and their message. Why oh you should have working this closely with an audience means Joel's sleight of hand has to be exact. And when it came to building his California dream home, that same attention to detail helped him create the illusion he was after. Well, it was our dream to not feel like we were in Los Angeles, the city, and we tried to take some old factors. Everything you see here is used brick. There are about 22,000 bricks. I literally chose every single brick so that they weren't perfect, so the texture was, uh, the textures contrasted each other, more or less like a, like a cobblestone appearance. The brickwork continues in the backyard, framing the pool. It is also used to give a gazebo an old world look. On the outdoor patio, Joel chose Spanish tile to create a soft transition to the stucco exterior. Ceramic tile inset in front of the door creates the illusion of an area rug. Inside, there is 8,000 square feet of living space. Joel Bauer is very proud of the home he has built because when he bought it, it was a disaster. The house had been practically destroyed by an earthquake. This house was a nightmare. Everything was damaged. This was a labor of love. And you're looking at about three and a half consecutive years of not even living here, but putting it together. The first thing he restored was the wood detail. This was known as the oak castle. We took out 30% of the exposed oak in this house. The passion here was in lightening it up, in maintaining the original integrity, structural integrity of the oak look. It's still the oak, uh, the oak castle, but we've softened the blow. One of the ways Joel softened the blow in the living room was by lightening some of the wood on the ceiling, but leaving the beams dark. In contrast, the walls and carpet are both off-white. Joel chose contemporary furniture, then restored the fireplace, which he says adds a bit of romance to the room. In the hall, Joel replaced wood floors with marble. He chose a honed marble tile because it has no shine. Here, too, the purpose was to create a soft look. This was the light of the house. This created the energy, and every house has to have an energy, and I think that if you if you pick one attribute in the house, it's going to be the marble and the consistency of it. And if you look at the length of the hallway, it's very inviting. It just invites you to kind of check things out. If there was one major problem during renovations, Joel says it was in the foyer. 49 and a half feet to the uppermost peak. Everything was dark. We wanted to whitewash. We had to strip everything, and the contractor that I had hired actually said, I'm leaving in two days. It was so miserable. Joel talked him into staying to help lighten the ceiling while, once again, leaving the beams dark. An ornate chandelier was used to create contrast. That same chandelier creates an elegant illusion when viewed from the bedroom where another complicated renovation took place. Joel took what used to be two bedrooms and made them into one master suite with special features. A slight step up separates the room into two areas, one for sitting and one for sleeping. We built the entire infrastructure on the whole side of the house with the windows that completely envelop the room. So the light comes in and hits the bed. You're not going to sleep late in the morning here. We don't even have curtains on the windows. The master bath also has the romantic appeal of a fireplace. There is a sunken tub and a magnificent view of canyon walls. You look out that back window and all you see are live trees. It makes you feel like you're not 
in an environment like Los Angeles. Joel wanted every room in his house to be a kind of refuge. That is especially true of his kitchen. The one thing I want to do when I come home is I want space. I love this. This is the area that I really create in. I'll bring in my paperwork. I'll be leaning over here 3 o'clock in the morning, working on a schematic diagram of an illusion for a trade show or a sales meeting. Off the kitchen is a formal dining room that once looked like this. Once again, Joel used oak accents to frame the room. Then, he added silk fabric to the walls to make the space more elegant. It took three and a half years, a little magic, and a lot of imagination to rebuild this oak palace, and the result is just magical enough to make one fast-talking magician feel like the king of his domain. Still to come on the show, the retreat master magician Lance Burton built for himself and his parents in the heart of old Kentucky. And 19th century art coupled with 21st century design at the Las Vegas home of illusionist Steve Wyrick. Welcome back to Magical Homes. I'm Nancy Glass. Our next guest is a master illusionist who looks at everything he does, from his stage act to decorating his home, as though it was a work of art. Steve Wyrick is a meticulous performer and designer whose eye for a jewel in the rough has resulted in a home that is truly a modern showcase with, as one might expect, a little bit of magic in every room. Steve Wyrick likes his magic dangerous. He has been seen on network television specials performing tricks that are death-defying and dramatic. And when it comes to his home, he likes the same kind of intensity. I look for something that's just really, really weird, really different, really unique that I've never seen before, and something that's so wild and so far out there. And I just assemble it all and put it together. Steve Wyrick says the look of his home is a combination of contemporary and industrial design. But it goes beyond furniture and objects. In fact, he sees his entire living space as art. When I'm shopping, when I'm in different countries and different cities, I actually look for works of art. Something that's really, really unique and really, really different. Steve Wyrick spent his first few months in Las Vegas living in hotel rooms. That's why he wanted a home with a lot of space. I would get up in the morning, go work out, go downstairs, hop in the car, go to the gym, come back, uh, do a little work in the office, do the shows, and then go back up to the suite and go to bed. I never left the casino. Then in 1998, Steve found this 2,600 square foot house that really cast a spell on him. When I walked in the door, I saw the high ceilings for a lot of my uh, original magic posters. Most of them are uh, early 1800s to early 1900s, turn of a century, antique uh, magician's posters. I've got a few really, uh, really large posters, as you can see, and I love the wall space. Steve wanted his home to have a lot in common with his magic show. My show has a real high-end contemporary feel to it, a real industrial, and I guess that's just part of me uh, on stage, just kind of bringing it home and just making me comfortable. Plus, I think it looks great. His dining room table is steel and glass and is offset by a black and white area rug and black suede and steel chairs. The light over the table creates a special illusion. The thing that I like about it most is it projects the light upward. It bounces off the ceiling and it uh, cascades down. The overall design scheme is dramatic yet neutral. And while some may find the color gray to be cold, Steve finds it complimentary and soothing. You can do anything with gray, with, if it's a light enough gray. And that's why I chose the carpet and the wall color, just being that light, uh, almost like a stone cold gray. And Steve says he stayed level-headed until he saw the chair. I saw this chair and just had to have it. It reminded me of, I guess, Cat in the Hat. It was just kind of a, a weird chair, and I'd never seen anything like it before. And I decided to go with uh, grays, blacks, whites, and then I wanted a stark color, really just to jump out at you. So, you know, I, I chose red. The kitchen is more toned down. Pale tile counters rest on bleached oak cabinets. But even here, Steve found a place for industrial design. You sit at a bar, you sit down uh, at a breakfast bar, 
and you begin to eat and you're just not at the right height. And the one thing that I love about the chairs is they're adjustable. They have the air cylinder in them, no matter if you're, uh, you're 5'2 or 6'6", six, six, you know, you can uh, sit comfortably. Steve continued the polished steel and high-tech look in his bedroom. The bed, it's an industrial look, a steel bed. It has what's called a grinder finish in it, so you can see the swirls. So when the light hits it at different angles, you actually see swirls and a texture. One of the most interesting and unique pieces in my entire house is found right here in my bedroom. I visited a quaint little furniture store and discovered this unique mirror. It's made out of cast aluminum, and no matter where you're sitting or standing in the room, your reflection bounces off of all four sides. I saw it, and I just had to have it. Steve offsets all the metal in the room with fabrics that are textured or patterned. It softens the look and adds a little richness. The effect is masculine and chic. I've always had the, the vision to look at something, to look at a, a, a jewel in the rough or anything in the rough, and just I've been able to just see what I could turn it into, you know, and to me, I've always enjoyed that because it's been a challenge. Steve developed his eye for decorating in an unexpected way. While he was perfecting his magic act, he made a living delivering firewood. That exposed him to a world he had never seen before. During that time, I was exposed to unbelievable homes. I mean, unbelievable apartments, unbelievable condos, unbelievable high-rises. What was neat was actually, you know, the people would, you know, let you in, you'd stack the wood on their balcony or wherever. And, I mean, you know, you walk through the homes. So, you know, you see all different types, uh, all different kinds of people, uh, you know, in their walks of life, how they live, um, you know, their different designs, their different feels, uh, just their different environments, you know. He was inspired by what he saw. That experience, combined with his natural creativity, led him to constantly search for just the right items for every inch of his home. I look at it as a great find as in, you know, I've been searching for a particular light fixture or, uh, you know, a particular vase or something like that. And you just find the exact perfect thing that fits and it just meshes with all the other uh, pieces of art in your house. And I, I consider that a really great find. Steve Weirich likes his act to be unexpected and his house to be the same way. It is industrial and inventive, contemporary and original. He is known for trying to top himself with each new trick. But decorating his home is the one trick that Steve Weirich may just leave the way it is. Like Steve Weirich, you've seen that many of the magicians on our show collect magic posters. In the magic industry, the posters are known as papers. You see, in the 1800s, the papers cost only pennies to mass produce and were usually tacked up to the side of barns to advertise upcoming shows. Now, after the shows, they were torn down and thrown out, which is why there are so few of them around today, especially in the mint condition seen in some of the homes in our show. That's what makes them such a popular item at auction and why bids for them sometimes run in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. When we come back, the illusion of space in a small Manhattan apartment with a master of mind games, Mark Salem. Hi, I'm Mark Salem, purveyor of mind games. The key to good living is in your home and in your mind. I'll unlock those secrets for you in a moment. Our next guest is Mark Salem, a former full-time college professor whose part-time magic act turned into an off-Broadway hit called Mark Salem, Purveyor of Mind Games. Mark uses his mind like other magicians use lasers and lights to create illusions and move objects. He uses a similar approach at home. First, he visualizes a room. Then, with a lot of help from his wife Tova, he creates mood and atmosphere, even space where there really was very little. Together, Mark and Tova have maximized every corner of their magical New York City home. New York City is one big town with thousands of small apartments. But Mark Salem and his wife Tova Botwinick say chin up. In fact, everything up. That's the best way to optimize space. It's a matter of building upwards. It's a matter of uh, when you have something, you got to get rid of something else, or else it's really going to uh, begin to uh, get out of hand. 
Mark Salem is one of the most sought-after magic men of our time. This college professor turned off-Broadway star is hailed as a wondrous magician and purveyor of mind games. Did you draw this? No. Draw this? No. Draw this. One more time, draw this? No. Draw this? No. Draw this. This time the turn did happen. Did you all see the turn? <laughs> But when it comes to his home life, all those mind games sometimes play tricks on him. That's where Tova steps in. She's a jewelry designer with a knack for color, space, and knowing when to call in a pro. A good mind has lots of categories, and you've got to be able to put things in it and be able to take it and retrieve it and put it back. Now, my mind's orderly that way. When it enters the physical environment, that's where I sometimes find it difficult to know, now, where was that put so that I could retrieve it? And Tova's superb at that. Tova and Mark have many of the same furnishings found in larger homes. It's the scale that's different. Instead of a sofa, they have a pull-out love seat and a small round dining table instead of a rectangular one. The most important thing is making space to live in, not to overcrowd your environment. You have to have someone to work with who is very creative in building things. Explain to him what you want. Uh, if you have a hundred books or a thousand books, please create something for me to, to put it someplace so that my books will not be all over the place and I have no room for me. Their bookshelves are built wide and high and are one of the most important elements in their home. I think that the books define who we are in many ways. I mean, certainly flowers do and tables and chairs. Nevertheless, there's nothing like the warmth and texture of a book. All this adds, I think, a sense of warmth place and also it adds a sense of um, th there's thinking going on here that's beyond merely surfaces because every book is beyond its cover there's something inside just like human beings and Mark says he once heard a great philosophy about buying books even though he hasn't applied it very well himself and that is when you buy books you should never buy a new book before you remove an old book and give it away or something along those lines because then at least you're assured of having space for that one book. Mark and Tova kept their walls light to make their living room feel more spacious and to accent one wall of exposed brick. Then they chose rich, warm colors, endurable but soft fabrics for their furniture. One realizes that color does have impact on how people think and how people have different kinds of moods. We certainly understand that blue is among the most tranquil colors. Uh, but red, particularly these deep, dark maroons, have a certain kind of tranquility that's also a, a rich feeling. It makes you feel comfortable, a kind of uh, the color of wine in many ways. Uh, it does the same thing that wine does in subduing your mind, making you feel relaxed. When I walk into my home, I want to feel cozy and good and wonderful. And I don't want to have anything in my house that is just to look at the show and not to be able to use myself. That's why when anyone walks into my living room, I say, it's so homey. And that's my living rooms, wherever they're going to be, how big they're going to be, they're always going to be homey. Their kitchen features high, streamlined cabinets for storage, which also leaves them plenty of counter space to prepare meals. Glass blocks were added to separate the kitchen from the living area and to shield the refrigerator from view. Downstairs, there are two bedrooms. Mark and Tova knew immediately which one they wanted to be the master bedroom, but there was one small problem, actually a big one, no light, because there was no window. So the couple hired contractors for the tough task of adding one. So the decision the was good. easy. Yeah. It was getting it, it done, done, but it was difficult. Very difficult. Uh, the walls of we the building know. are a, um, granite. granite, thick granite, and it took several days just to drill through right. the walls. Now, their room with a view is one of their favorite places to spend time. Here, too, space was maximized. The headboard opens up for storage. We have company a lot, and you always need extra blankets and extra pillows and uh, linens, and there's got to be a place to put it. Mark Salem and Tova Botwinick have enjoyed their New York apartment since 1991. They have created a warm and comfortable dwelling, a place to entertain family and friends. And they have learned that after a long day in the big city, a small and cozy environment is truly magic at its best. When I come into the house, I, I do find it vital to have a home that is comfortable, secure, 
warm, as well as stimulating. I think uh, it's the combination of all those factors that are essential for one to feel I'm home. Up next on our show, Lance Burton, the daring magician who has pulled off some of the most incredible acts in the world, likes to slow things down when he's on break at his Kentucky retreat. Hi, I'm Lance Burton, master magician. Oh, hold on, buddy. In just a few minutes, I'm going to show you the magic of my old Kentucky home. Stay tuned. Lance Burton is a world-famous master magician and one of the biggest acts around. He travels through time, survives being crushed by wrecking balls, and narrowly escapes the grinding wheels of a roller coaster after being handcuffed to the tracks. So rest assured, the one thing Lance Burton needs after months of performing is rest. And for him, there's no better place than the home he has built for himself and his parents in the heart of old Kentucky. I don't really know much about architecture. I just know what I see in the movies. I guess I saw Gone with the Wind. I thought that's the way houses were supposed to be made. For master magician Lance Burton, the trick was to build a house with the feel of the Old South. I always liked the balconies on the front of houses. It just sort of seemed romantic, you know, that whole era of uh, pre-Civil War, Southern elegance, I guess. He is one of the biggest draws in magic. A showman with both comedic timing and daredevil style. He is a risk taker, always striving for the next narrow escape. But he is a gentleman too, known as much for delighting a young audience as an older one. I'm gonna send you back in time two weeks because two weeks ago, you were not in Las Vegas. Here we go. Three cups and three grapes. These are the ball. At the vacation home he has built in Kentucky, Lance Burton also has a loyal audience. His parents live here year round, and Lance returns every few months to recharge his batteries. When you're a magician, you're usually a magician 24 hours a day. It's not like being an actor or a singer. When you're off stage, I guess people don't generally ask you to act or sing for them. But when you're a magician, people ask you, hey, show me a trick. But that's, that's the fun part. That's why, that's why we all got into magic. It is a large yet restful home, 15,000 square feet on 110 acres, with a backdrop in complete contrast to the one Lance sees in the town where he performs, Las Vegas. All the green that's in Las Vegas is there because you have sprinklers and watering systems, man-made things. But when you come back to Kentucky, everything's green as far as the eye can see. And when you stand up on the balcony and look out over that view, that's the thing that strikes me, is, is the color green. Lance actually grew up 50 miles away in Louisville, and even though his magic act has taken him around the world, it was Kentucky where Lance chose to build the home that his mother had always imagined. My mom was always talking about having a house, and she used to draw a floor plan on a piece of paper, kind of doodling. And then one day I said, well, we ought to build it. The plan began with a double-wide foyer. We wanted to try and make that uh, a dramatic entrance, and we wanted to continue that uh, sort of theme when you walk in the front door. So the double staircase and the foyer and the, the dining room and the living room all sort of keep that theme. The formal dining and living areas are on opposite sides of the entranceway, and either can be closed off with sliding French doors. Cherry stained wood was used to tie the rooms together. The stain was also added to the custom bookshelves in the living room, and the molding on the bookshelves was cut to match the molding above, along the ceiling. The fellow that built the house is a friend of ours that lives in the farm next door, and he was a general contractor before he retired, so I convinced him to come out of retirement one more time to build this house. He's uh, very, very thorough, very detail-oriented. There was only one change to Mom's original floor plans, the floors themselves. When her and my dad were first married, they had an apartment or a house that had hardwood floors, and for some reason she didn't like them. 
They were very difficult to clean and polish. We kept telling her, Mom, that was 30 years ago. You know, they have much easier ways to do it now. But she finally gave in. But Lance gave in, too, by adding soft carpeting to the family room. We just want to make it kind of, you know, open and friendly. We spend most of the time here in the family room, and, you know, with the TV and the fireplace and the kitchen's right there and the veranda. So this is sort of the living area. Off the comfortable family room, there is an open and accessible kitchen and a screened-in veranda with a view of the Kentucky countryside. My mom always wanted a screened-in porch so that the insects, you know, won't bother you in the summer and that's a nice place to have breakfast in the morning or sit out and rock in the evening and, and just relax. Each of the home's seven bedrooms is decorated with a different theme. Vintage furniture collected over the years was combined for a country design room while other bedrooms are decorated by color. It is the perfect family house and the perfect getaway for a modern-day magician who finds his best inspirations often come when he is surrounded by the magic of another time at his old Kentucky home. There's more to come on Magical Homes. Next, some of our magicians reveal the most magical thing in their homes. Abracadabra will be right back. If you have questions or comments, we'd like to hear from you. Write to us at Magical Homes, care of HGTV, Box 50970, Knoxville, Tennessee, 37950. Be sure to include your daytime phone number. Think about it. In almost every home, there is something that is a little more special than anything else, a little more magical, if you will. Well, when we asked some of the magicians in our show about the most magical item in their homes, we were surprised by some of the answers and impressed by the way they've made magic a part of their decor. You know, one of the coolest things about my house is that what appears to be a poster on a wall is actually a secret door that enters my bedroom. And uh, I had built this in the shop at my theater where we build the magical illusions for my show. And the switches that control it are even concealed. So not only is the door itself a secret, but so is the switch. But if you're standing outside and you want to enter the door, the uh, secret switch to it is this poster of Harry Houdini. And then that opens the secret door. People that come to my house always enjoy this because it's a uh, it uh, just catches them by surprise. This is where it all started. These are some of the very first things that I ever used when I was performing magic. Uh, this was a little box in which I would show it to be empty. And in the blink of an eye, it would be filled with uh, bright, colorful handkerchiefs. Uh, this is my very first business card. This would have to be uh, the biggest treasure in this whole cabinet to me. When I was, uh, I guess, nine or 10, somewhere in there, I uh, was able to uh, start doing some, uh, some larger shows, and uh, I bought myself some business cards. I was really excited about that. Uh, right here, this was my very first book on magic, which was given to me by my brother, uh, Cub Scout Magic. And uh, I tell you what, it really, really challenged me. I tried a lot of stuff in that book. It was, it was incredible. This was one of my very first magic tricks with two stainless steel ball bearings. In the blink of an eye, I could make a third appear and as if by magic, a fourth. That's how it all began. One of the things I love about this house is it comes with this secret passageway. I have no idea why it was built, but it makes the house magical for me. I'd tell you what's back there, but it's a secret. That's our show. We hope you've enjoyed it and are able to take with you a few ideas to add a little hocus pocus to designing your home. I'm Nancy Glass. Thanks to the terrific magicians who joined us and thank you for watching.